All right then, so today I got this Trollson three-door reach-in freezer, and it is froze up, and it's not holding temperature. Now, on arrival, it was running, so I want to shut it off, and I'll unplug the compressor right here, this plug, and I'm doing this here at the relay box of the Intellitrol. Next step is to remove this air deflector. Now, this piece sits up top, on the top of the unit, and it's really easy to take off. So once I removed it, I put this hairdryer in there, closed the doors for a little while, and that didn't really do too much. So this is the ice buildup on the inside. I want to work at it a little bit on the inside and work at it the ice a little bit from the outside. So in the meantime, I'm going to shove my hairdryer blowing right up in there, and I found that to be pretty much the most effective and fastest way to get rid of this ice. Now, going back to this air deflector, don't lose it. It's important. Make sure it's put on right. And you can actually measure your return and supply temperatures here. Now, the more ice that you can get rid of, ultimately that helps you get the job done quicker. So even though this is on the outside of the, the box, I want to get this ice out of here. That way it doesn't keep the door cold. It helps the top of the cover gets warm. And you see, when you hit it like this, if it doesn't split apart, you know it's still frozen from the bottom. Now to diagnose these trolls and freezers, it's critical to know this information here. How to get into the controller's parameters. There's two different levels. You have a basic level, and then you have the engineering level. And this is the engineering level, and it allows you to get into these parameters. Okay? Very important. You've got step-by-step -step directions here. you got to follow them. you got to follow them carefully, because if you don't, if you screw one thing up, then it's going to mess you up and you got to start all over again. And it's annoying. Now luckily I was able to edit most of that time consuming stuff out of the footage to save you all the, the pain of watching it. But you got to get in there and you got to type 99E as an echo. Then you got to hit set and then you got to hit the microphone button underneath. Very, very particular about that. And then you get this list of menus. And of course for every three digit character you do have the corresponding description in that manual. I'll make that manual available to y'all. If you look in the description, you'll see it, how to get it. So there's all these different parameters and settings that I'm not gonna really discuss, just showing you how to really get there. I'll talk about the ones that are gonna be useful today. And those ones is RO right here, which I do a little bit later. And the other, the other ones that are useful are going to be the, the temperature sensors. You've got a cabinet temperature sensor, you've got an evaporator temperature sensor, and you've got a discharge line temperature sensor. And I'll get to those in a little bit as well. You can't diagnose this thing without knowing that. And well, it looks like I'm making some progress here with my melting of my ice with my hair dryer trick. But there's still a lot of ice up there. But we are making progress and it's a lot faster than what it would have been. But now I lose my camera, I go up there and I can take a little glimpse of the ice that's still left on there. It's still a lot. At this point I can take the top off and look down in there and I can see that a lot of my water is going outside and it's almost about to flood on the top of the box. And I would prefer that to not happen. I find it very interesting the way the ice forms around each of the tubes between each of the aluminum fins and the forces that bind the ice to the coil as it's melting and determining when is a safe and appropriate time to pry the ice off of the surface without damaging the coil. Now if you wait long enough, the ice will just, it'll just fall right off, but it's this moment that, you know, it's still attached to the coil. When can you do this without damaging it? More importantly, how hard do you have to press? If you press on it hard and it doesn't move, it's still bound to that coil pretty tight. So don't force it. But it's like perfect right now, so. Save time, pull it off, watch yourself because this coil will cut the shit out of you if you're not careful. And get as much ice out as you can manually because you'd have to get all the ice out you can't leave no 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 stuff like this in the on the on the end 
you got to get it all out. You run the risk of making an improper diagnosis if you're making your diagnosis based on refrigerant pressures or temperatures, and that goes with any refrigerant circuit on any type of refrigeration system. And you have to get all the ice out and start the system up fresh. Now there's a reason I don't want the water to overflow out here on the top of the unit. And that's because I don't want to make a mess up there, number one. I'd rather my mess be contained. But number two, all my electrical is down there along the bottom of the top panel up there. So, you know, that base that the skid is sitting on has all the wiring and everything. So I don't want all that wet. So I made this little ghetto rig here to scoop it out because I didn't have a shop back and I had none of that shit with me. So it works. Scoop it out to the back, let it go down so it stays out of my electrical raceway. Works for me. And now I'm about ready to start this back up. So this ice should pop right off because the suction line's warm enough to where it's gonna start melting along the inside. So hitting it on the outside, you know, you just gotta you just gotta smack the ice just perfectly. You don't wanna smack the copper or whatever's underneath the ice. So just use caution and pop the ice off. I mean, you probably may not have to do this, but I think it's better to do this. Those are the two sensors that go inside. You've got the, the cabinet sensor, the blue one, and the... I mean the green one and then you got the evaporator sensor which is the blue one it mounts inside the coil like that so everybody uses the fins you just bend the fins over I didn't really do a pretty job here but you can do the flathead maneuver as I call it and it, and it doesn't go anywhere once it's there as long as nobody pulls it. Okay, here's some helpful information. You gotta know how to test your sensors. You gotta test them in ice water, and you test them at 32 degrees, and when they're at 32 degrees, they should measure 32.7 K ohms, okay? And they're really not kidding about that 32.7 ohms. That's exactly what it was. You just wanna back probe sensors when they're in ice water. And then you can check it, you can test it, you rub on it like that, and watch, see, it's immediate, it reacts immediately. So as the temperature goes up, the resistance goes down on these ones. And so then the opposite's also true, as the temperature goes down, the resistance goes back up. So it's confusing, it can be confusing, don't let it confuse you. So why is knowing all that important? Because watch closely. I want you to try to see if you can figure out the problem here. It's like go into the engineering level and go through these parameters. You should see something. The unit has been on, has been running. It is below freezing in there in the 20s. So what is wrong with this picture? Based on what we've learned. All right, well now that's the EL, that's the evap temperature sensor. That's the one we buried in the coil. There's no way that should be 89 degrees. It's not, it's not. So either we have a bad sensor or a bad controller. When we back probe the sensor and measure the resistance, we get 7.3 K ohms, which is not anything close to where it should be. You guys remember just a few minutes ago, as we were cooling the probe down, the resistance was increasing. Well, this is colder than a glass of water. This should be above 32,000 K ohms, but it's not. This is a bad sensor. This thing's stuck on 20. It doesn't really seem to want to go down any further than, than uh, 20. All right, so I'm connected here. The only thing is that I'm connected to discharge, but I think my discharge pressure isn't high enough, but I could be wrong because I'm in a cold room here. I got an evaporator right here blowing cold air right here. The condenser coil is dirty, which complicates things obviously but I'm stuck at 18 degrees it's not going down anymore I feel like I need a little bit more 
I'm going to get some refrigerant. I'm going to just add a little bit to it, like an ounce or two, because it doesn't take much. It only holds 32 ounces. So as I add an ounce, I'll be able to see the temperature slowly coming down, slowly. Like if I add an ounce, it'll come down to like 15 maybe. So let's see. All right, so I got... Uh, I'm gonna fill. I'm gonna fill my hose up with refrigerant, liquid refrigerant. Or actually, here's what I'm gonna do. Purge it like this. Okay. Now I got liquid. Okay. Now my hose is full. Okay. That's like three ounces probably in the hose. Maybe two ounces, not sure. But it's a matter of ounces. So now I'm gonna close this off. So I've got a full hose and a partially filled up manifold right here. That's off, that's off, that's off. Now I'm gonna dump it into the, into the suction side. We're at 18 degrees just now. I've got one thermometer right there and another one right there on discharge. It's discharge air. And this is return air. So a couple things here. This is pretty much where I bottomed out last time at 18. Now this here, it was going down real good. So understand number eight is our temperature leaving the coil and 15.8, that's the box temperature. That's the return. But this is kind of stalling out now. At 15.8 is about, 15.7 and eight degrees is about the temperature drop that I have across it. That's the best I can do. I think uh, this thing might actually be overcharged. So as I remove some refrigerant, the temperature drop started improving. So this is kind of like the opposite is true. As I let out a little bit each time, my numbers go down more and more, just a little bit. This is why it's good to use a scale and weigh it in and to do things right. if you don't you have to end up doing this or dumping it all out and weighing it back in which I, I should ought to do but I don't have a good enough scale to do that I'm gonna leave it like this for like 10 minutes come back to it and see where, where it's at so yeah it seems to me that this system had probably too much refrigerant in it whoever worked on it the last time before I did probably put too much in it didn't weigh it in or they had some kind of refrigerant issue or whoever last charged it and ever since then it's been struggling to work right um, because when I remove this refrigerant it starts performing better and yeah I did add some refrigerant before I started taking some out but before I even started any of that with the refrigerant it was stalling at like 18 degrees it wasn't wasn't coming down 18 degrees 16 14 something like that I don't remember but as I remove refrigerant it starts to perform better now it's at this point in time I decide to leave now that I know I don't need other materials and go get the sensor and so about two hours later I'm back 
I can see it's gone down now. Maybe it's gone into a defrost while I was gone. If it did, it would have been a short defrost, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But look at the EVAP sensor. When it's colder, it shows even worse. It shows it to be at 101 degrees. That's terrible. So what does this do? This causes the defrost cycle to prematurely terminate because the controller is thinking that the coil has already defrosted and is already satisfied at, at its defrosted temperature. This failed sensor is going to cause short defrosts, very short defrosts. Now what I'm doing here is I'm manually defrosting. I'm starting a manual defrost to see if I can get the coil warm a little bit so that that sensor will come out good. In the process I've verified my amp draws and I can hear the ice defrost. And while I was doing all this, I put it in defrost, verified my amp draws. While all this is happening, I think it was right around this time, I didn't get it on camera, but defrost terminated. This was like five minutes into defrost. The defrost terminated and the condenser restarted. So that is conclusive that the sensor caused it to freeze up. So now here I am cutting the black foam sealant on the top, taking out the old blue sensor. Pretty simple, just comes right out. Just want to be careful not to cut any of the wires when you're doing that. It just goes down that vertical stack, as I'll call it. Take it out of the coil like this. That's why this flathead is essential to have. Pop it out, and you know, it's not too much to this part. And it is kind of a little tangled with the other ones, so just want to carefully, you know, fish it through. From one end to the other and there it goes and this is the new one and you know it's a pretty difficult thing to do all this work and perform all the work on the ladder with only one hand and you got to use your other hand to record what the first hand's doing so i do the best i can with the footage i right hear i'm mounting the new sensor in place that's what i do first and then i can route it back because this one is actually perfectly just the length that it needs to be 74 inches it's made specifically for for this design and this setup you know, tuck it back in there if you want you can put some of the the sealant gum that you get at united you can put that in there and then put a new strip of uh, foam tape or whatever up on the top but it just depends you obviously don't want any air gaps so you you want it to seal good that's for sure no infiltration and all right it looks pretty pretty in there good enough to where i can move on to the next portion and then i put a tie strap right there to hold it in place tie strap over on the top and then I just run it along with the green one all the way back to the Trollson relay box and now once I get the wire tucked I like to you know tuck it underneath some of the other ones I like to make it look as if that's how it was before it's ready to put the covers on now so first one goes the riser which is that right there and then you slide the raceway cover over the riser and then after that goes the relay box which is right there the electrical box and the discharge sensor comes out the side of it and connects to the discharge line. So now I got it running again. I'm gonna go in there and take a look and see what's going on. 99E. You can also go into another menu that's A10 or A01. It's in the manual. But you can see now my sensor for the evaporator is 14 degrees. Cabinet sensor, 14 degrees. Roughly the same. But I don't know if you remember or not earlier, but my display temperature right here, the CB, was showing two degrees higher than what my gauges were. So I went in there and I changed the RO, which is the display temperature difference that it displays on the screen. You can go negative two, positive two, or whatever, and adjust it. And I did that earlier, so I'm undoing that now. So see, that makes a little more sense. My cabinet would be 16 degrees or so, and the evaporator is going to be a little bit colder. And that's all, you guys.